David, tell us when you exactly started this layout. Um, well, the, I guess about uh, 20 odd years ago, um, the late John French, uh, Ian Castle and uh, Dave Underwood and myself were all discussing um, a railway. Everybody said, don't build it under the trees. So uh, I, of course, built it under the trees. <laughs> and this property overall here is what, five acres? Five acres, yes, yes. And it just occupies the northeast corner of the... Yes, yes. And about how, many, how much track have you laid here? Um, we have uh, 240 feet double track uh, main line with a reverse loop of 100 feet back into the shed again for Rutherport. Okay, and then the, I guess the shed is kind of the central part of the layout here. Yes, and then the yes. Garden layout. Okay. Yeah, the two stations, one either side of the shed, yeah. Okay, and what's the minimum radius that you chose here? Uh, inside the shed it's six feet, um, outside the shed probably about 12. In terms of the, is it flat or did you have a bit it's, of a It's reasonably flat. Um, the original shed uh, was about uh, six inches lower than this one. So when we had to put this shed in, we had to raise everything by, by about six inches, um, which uh, was okay for the uh, part on the metal stilts, uh, but um, the part that was on blocks uh, was is a bit lower so it does it goes down about probably about two inches altogether right what type of control system have you got we have the prodigy a prodigy of dance um we have both the handheld units and the wireless ones for when we're working outside right this is the atlas product here but similar to the gauge master one that's sold in the yes region. yes and then your point control is um point controls is from the the main switchboard here um, inside there, the old Folger X motors. Um, outside, we're just switching. We've just switched over to the Tortoise motors, oh, okay. uh, which we're finding a bit more reliable. The trouble with the old old motors is that the, the little springs keep flicking out of them, and we never find them again. Right. With your outside portion here, the north side here, as you said, is on stilts or yeah, it, yes. it's on steel superstructure here. Tell us more how that was built. Well, uh, Dave Underwood um, used to run an, an outfit called Under, um, Underwood Industries in Richmond. We spent many a Wednesday um, making these tubular units. So one tube fits inside the other and with a, a, a nut and bolt to, to do it all up so we can adjust it somewhat. Unfortunately, due to the six inch difference we've had to pack it all now but uh, the original intent was to do that and um, then the the baseboards themselves are um, three quarter inch ply with a plastic covering either side uh, which sits inside um, an l-shaped uh, framework and dave welded all those up in the in the shop so i've been very fortunate to have uh, very useful friends oh, absolutely <laughs> And then on the south part there, where it's uh, more ground level, how, how did you build that? Uh, well, again, it's still on the same basis for, for most of it, um, but there is just one short portion there that is based uh, on the edge of a wall, uh, a, a broken paving slab wall. But again, it's still held up on those stilts. So uh, it's, uh, um, but the trouble is that it's, there's very little room to work underneath it. So once the the baseboards rot out, which we've, we've replaced about 17 of them so far. Um, we have to uh, bolt them back in again rather than screwing them from underneath. Right.
Inside this shed, this shed is what size? 24 feet by 12. Okay. You have, even though there's one layout, you you really have two... Two tiny, stations, yes. Two yeah. stations or two yeah. unique yeah. baseboards. Or... Saxon Hall is a through station, uh, which is really a glorified scenic fiddle yard, um, which is uh, supposed to be in a, uh, a small town in Kent okay. on the main line. Um, the reverse loop into Rotherport is loosely, very loosely, based on Rye um, with some of the sort of buildings that you would have in Rye. Um, pretty well all of the buildings are scratch built except the two signal boxes and one warehouse, uh, which are kits. All the rest are scratch built. Um, Ian Castle, myself, uh, built pretty well all of them except a few items were replaced after the, uh, the, the tree falling on the building um, and built by a professional uh, model maker. The insurance company insisted on that. The era that you're modeling here, it looks to be BR in the yes, it's 50s and 60s? It's, or? Yeah, it's um, British Railways, uh, 1950s to 60s. Yeah, yeah. And as I said, it's a, a small town in Kent so on, the, on the through main line. And then on the Rutherport side, uh, the branch terminus that you have here. Well, this is this is uh, um, East Sussex area, um, and um, as I said, based on Rye, uh, or loosely based on that. Obviously, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, one for one, but it's uh, some of the buildings would be seen in that area. There are one or two buildings that I rather liked. Um, we used to. Uh, get a magazine from England called This England and uh, well, one or two buildings in there that I really took my eye and I decided to put them into the layout anyway. Modeler's license. You're right, absolutely. Now, with your uh, scratch built structures or, uh, that you have here, are they, ba how did you, like, are they based on pit photographs you've taken? And yes, yes, they're, they're pretty well all based on photographs or uh, pictures from in books. And um, on the odd trip to Rye, um, I use my wife as a, a measuring stick. <laughs> She's exactly five foot tall, so it just works out perfectly. So I get her to stand in certain spots, and then I've got it. Ah, okay. And then, and most of the buildings are built from styrene, um, and uh, there are a couple in there that uh, um, have sort of cardboard based, but. Um, and we are slowly lighting them all up now. Well, that would look fantastic when that's done. Well, yeah, all, all of them have got interiors to them, so uh, they're sort of ready for setting the lights. Now, part of the the branch terminal scene that really catches, I think, everyone's eye is the the West Coast uh, or South Coast uh, fishery. Yes. There. Yeah. Describe more about what what you've done there. Well, uh, there again, um, it's. Uh, it's it's sort of it's called but the, the town is called Rotherport, so um, it's the sort of mouth of the Rother as uh, not like the real thing, which is virtually landlocked and then moved out of the town. And, and uh, but this that the, the river comes out into the into the sea, and uh, on the on the banks um, uh, are some industrial buildings, which are fairly newish looking ones. Uh, where we presume that they were damaged during the Second World War or, 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 or smashed during the Second World War and replaced with buildings of that type. Um, then the, some of the warehouses are older um, and uh, particularly the one on the end is, is uh, supposed to be quite old. And then the fishing camp, the fishing uh, camp is, uh, um, has two or three fishing boats that uh, come in and unload and uh, then the, uh, the, uh, the vans are loaded and off to London, the fish go. And you built the fish boats yourself as well? Right? Um, no, the, the, uh, the fishing boat is a kit, um, uh, and, uh, but the smaller boats are all uh, uh, either kit conversions or, or built from scratch, yeah. Uh, yeah, it doesn't
2017 in May was quite a bad year. And, uh, yes, uh, yes, we had. Uh, it was very strange because we we were thinking that winter was over, um, but uh, in one day in May uh, we had a freak windstorm, and uh, it blew a neighbour's cottonwood tree down uh, on top of two of our trees, and all three trees fell in onto the shed and crushed it. Uh, very little survived. Uh, two locomotives, oh sorry, three locomotives survived. Um, one was the Q1, which uh, the late John French had built for me, so that was a treasured item. Um, another is a rebuilt West Country, which still needs a new front uh, pony truck on it, um, so it will be coming back into service eventually. Um, very little else. There were a couple of coaches and a few wagons, but uh, um, a couple of, uh, about a I think it was about four buildings were left. The rest was destroyed. After something like that happens, I think many modelers kind of reassess about what they want to do post or how they want to get past that. And I would assume that, you know, sometimes they go <laughs> off in a different direction or, you know, pull the pull the or pull well, the was, I was obviously very disappointed, but um, there were one or two things about the old shed that irritated me so uh, this was an advantage to put those right um, okay. so it, it, it and and we decided right from the start luckily I had uh, a good insurance company and uh, once I explained to their adjuster that a toy train could cost five thousand dollars for a locomotive um, they were very good and uh, they uh, they settled up pretty quickly the, the annoying fact was the municipality got involved in the loss and uh, my son, son-in-law and myself built the shed with help from Dave Underwood uh, for about $3,000. The replacement shed has cost the insurance company $44,000. So, um, yes, it's, uh, it's a bit of a game, this insurance. <laughs> so, well, certainly you being in the business, yes. you, you knew how much to insure your Yes, yes, your yes. It, it is very important that you, you insure to value and better still to list your locomotives with their values and any, any particularly large valued coaches or anything like that. For instance, uh, the, uh, the uh, Pullmans that we have here, you know, I think they're about seven or eight hundred pounds a pop now, so um, it's... Uh, well to list it all out so the insurance company knows and you can make it part of your contents too so you don't have to get special coverage for it right. but just make sure your contents are enough to cover it all
So back in 2017, on my visits here, it, it, your layout seemed to be getting close to completion here. Uh, yes. Apart from some lights, so you, I mean, it does. It almost doesn't look like it's that much different. No, it, yeah. It, I, I, I liked what I had. Um, there were one or two buildings I wasn't too happy with, so um, we've replaced them with something else. Um, the the wall uh, at the back here is uh, all laser cut, which uh, I spent uh, two weeks holiday making the original one, so. Um, it was good not to have to do that. And we've come a long way in O-Gage. Um, there are things available now that, that weren't available when we built it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been a lot easier. And we have things like uh, the static graphs and things like that, which make it easier too. So what changes did you incorporate in the Well, we put, a, we put an extra track in on Saxon Hall. And then we put an extra track in on Rotherport as well, which uh, does give us a bit more operating room. The trouble is, um, with all the goodies you can get in O-Gage these days, we bought more rolling stock and more, more, uh, more stuff to put in there. So um, we're still in, at a state where we, we couldn't put anything else on there because there's no room. But uh, yeah. Right, I remember the, um, the, the cattle lock happened to be on the opposite side. At one yes, point. yes. Yes, and, you yeah, yeah. and uh, buildings have changed. Um, uh, Dave Underwood's uh, Underwood Industries there has a, a far more uh, attractive location, as does Mr. Castle's uh, coal company. Uh, much better building than the old one. So, You've actually chosen to honour some of your friends? Yes, that past friends yes, no longer yes with us. Uh, some of the old gauge guys are, are in here. Um, there's a John French... Uh, who has sadly passed away quite a while ago. Pat Bush uh, has passed away. Um, yes, we have several buildings. Um, uh, there's a, um, uh, one of the middle warehouse there is uh, named after two of the two of the group. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great way of uh, like incorporating fresh. Yeah, it makes a bit of fun of it too. Yes, I think so. So. Now that you've gotten this far, what you're like, how much more do you, are you cl close to completing? Or well, yes, uh, I think we are a little bit closer than where we were. We have some street lighting in and uh, the station lighting in on uh, on Rotherport. One or two of the buildings are lit up. Uh, we have a lot more to light up yet, and then we have to put lighting all in on the Saxon Hall side, um, as well as signalling. Uh, the signals, one or two of the signals are there. But they're not connected up yet, so that all has to be done. Right. It's just a matter of time. It, uh, <laughs> now that four years have passed, was it kind of like you lost those four years, or no, no, not really. No, um, I, I prefer it, it it today as it is today. Um, it, it, we have put some improvements in. Um, there's still some little improvements to do. We we still have to put some uh, brick edging along the the. Uh, um, the tunnel mouths and the uh, the bridge mouths there, and uh, you know there's lots of lots of small jobs to do, but um, it's it's nice to get in here in the winter. We've got nice heating in here, so we can sit in the wall and get on with a few jobs.
How did you ever enter into this hockey? Well, I I used to I used to live in England in a place called Loughton in Essex, and um, my grandmother lived in Ashford in Middlesex, uh, and uh, it entailed getting on the train with Mum and uh, travelling uh, into into London uh, to Waterloo, and sometimes Mum would let me stand on one of the platforms and watch the big merchant navies going out and uh, it was very exciting to uh, pass the Felton goods yards and uh, watch the uh, the electric units whizzing past and uh, yeah it, it just fascinated me so um, I did have a, a Hornby train set um, and I was into double O gauge for uh, quite a long time and uh, I joined the top link club here in Vancouver and I was got very, very friendly with the late John French uh, and Ian Castle and uh, later on Dave Underwood arrived from England. And um, we, uh, <laughs> my, my introduction to O-Gage was, was very, very strange. Um, John French had gone into hospital for an operation and he was into P4. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was always nagging me to go into P4 instead of double O. And uh, at the time I was building some double O gauge uh, Southern brake vans. And anyway, I, uh, I, I went visited him in the hospital and uh, he started nagging me again about uh, getting, into o, uh, getting into P4. So I said to him in the end, I was exasperated with him. I said, uh, no, I think I'd rather go into O gauge. And just, that, that said goodbye and off we went. About three weeks later, I went, he was still in hospital, and uh, I went into the hospital, and he was due to come out the day after. And he said, I have a couple of things here. And I said, Oh, yeah. So he said, uh, Yeah, this is a B4 uh, dock tank kit, and I'm going to build it. And this is a Vulcan Terrier locomotive, and you're going to build it. <laughs> so, so I said, okay. So he took it away and uh, we met again once he was out of hospital and he said, how are you getting on with your terrier? I said, I haven't done anything. So he said, you better start. Because look at this. And there was this before, all in brass, and he built it all. So I went back home and I started work and I built the terrier. And we got a couple of lengths of track and a controller. Well, we used the double O gauge controllers, obviously. And, ran them up and down. They said, wow, this is, this is something else. This is much heavier, bigger. It's, you know, it's, it's quite appealing, isn't it? So within a, a couple of weeks, we were both hooked and <laughs> we, we both sold our, all our stuff and bought Ogate stuff. So here we are. And granted back then, it isn't like anything it is now. No. So much of it is now ready to run. Yeah, you had to scratch build pretty well everything, you know. And there were some kits, but you had to build them, and they were mostly brass, so they a lot of soldering involved. Yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was fun, but... Uh... Obviously, this is can't is not just one person's effort or one man's effort. No, so. not at all. No, no. Um, the the Van Gogh group uh, have all um, put a great deal of effort into it. Um, it's uh, you know it's a it's a big plus for belonging to a club. Um, 
And of course, we we the the Van Gogh group all belong to the Gage O Guild, um, which is a great uh, vehicle for information and uh, all the rest of it. So, um, yeah, very fortunate. Dave Underwood, um, Joe Baxfield, um, uh, Ian Castle, uh, George Mackey, and Gordon Jones, who are our uh, our uh, electronics experts. Uh, everybody has a, a little uh, little piece of uh, greatness which uh, adds to the group, and uh, yeah, we're very grateful for all the help I've had. Yeah. Well, thank you, David. No, thank you. I appreciate, appreciate you help. taking the time to, like I say, introduce your layout to, and uh, I'm sure the folks watching this video will, uh, you know, come to appreciate what you've done here and had to redo here. So, but uh, thanks so much. Thank you.